quick story. Um, this uh, somebody um, was aware of an animal research laboratory in their town, and um, they were aware of some documentation about animal abuse that was uh, that was held in a specific place inside a specific building at this specific uh, university facility. And um, so they were, um, they had no one to work with. They didn't know anybody else. They knew they wanted to do something to expose the uh, cruelty in this laboratory. So they had no skills. They had no friends. They had no, in the, in the movement, they really had nothing working to their advantage. Um, one day they were reading a newspaper and they um, read a statistic, a little like a little news thing that said that one out of, on average, one out of 38 times um, that you leave your house, you accidentally leave the door unlocked. And the person thought, okay, that's interesting. How could I apply that to this particular situation I have at this uh, laboratory? So this person reasoned that it's probably more likely that you would leave a door unlocked at your place of work than your home. Um, so this person went to this particular building, this particular door, um, one night and jiggled the doorknob and it was locked, as you would expect, um, after hours. And uh, this person went back the next day um, and did the same thing, and they went back the next day. And they reasoned that, statistically speaking, one out of, if they went there 38 days in a row, they would find the door unlocked once, based on this statistic that they had read. On the 27th day, that door was unlocked. And what they found inside, well, the rest is history. I won't go into specifics. You'll forgive me for being vague. Um, but what is that? Like, what is that accomplishment? What is that 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 person did? Is that a skill set? It's not a skill. Everyone can jiggle a doorknob. It, I would argue it's a mindset. Um, that person exploited a loophole and used it to achieve great victories for animals in this situation. Um, so, um, and this is a mindset that you can cultivate in yourself. Now, one thing that I feel like I've always noticed is that what makes a great activist is not a set of skills, as I said. It's not what they, they know. It's not the skills that they have. It's the way they think. And I think we've all seen this. Um, it's, a, it's the way, what makes a great activist is how you think. And I kind of began this journey of like decoding or trying to understand what makes great activists um, more intensely several years ago when I started a book project where I was compiling stories from really successful activists who had done great things and achieved some great victories and taken some big risks for animals. And I began to compile their stories. Oftentimes these stories were shared with me anonymously. Um, and uh, so I'm going to kind of look at like the common denominators and try to understand like what made these victories happen? How do these people think? And so um, what I found is I could sort of distill down um, this mindset into seven principles or seven ways of thinking that separates highly effective activists from people that just you know hang out on Facebook. Now, um, I, uh, it's really important for me. I think the, the name of this talk is like in the brochure. It's like uh, the seven laws of militants or something. Let's go ahead and rename that right now. I want to make this more accessible. Let's just say like the seven laws of like a highly achieving activist. Um, and um, as I talk, I am going to give some stories that are sort of um, slanted towards like the animal liberation front and stories like that. Uh, mostly because I think it's more interesting to just tell those stories. But um, I really want this talk to be relevant for everybody, and I really tried really hard to make these principles relevant to every activist, even if on the surface it appears I'm just talking about like direct action and like super tough stuff. Um, in reality, I want, I, I, it's really important for me this is relevant to everybody, so just keep that in mind. So let's get into it. Seven laws of uh, highly effective activists, seven laws of action, seven laws of militants. Number one, um, People who are highly effective activists know that nothing is ever as complicated as you think it is. Um, I had another story that was shared with me anonymously about a very similar situation to the story, the story I told in the beginning. Laboratory person wanted to get inside, um, had no idea how to do that. They had, a, um, a, they had read a lock picking book once several years ago on how to pick locks. They had a lock pick that they made at home, literally from a bobby pin, like you've seen that in the movies. I don't know, like you pick a lock with a bobby pin, like that actually can work sometimes. And then they had a steak knife as the other tool needed to pick the lock. And they had no idea how to pick locks other than this book they had read several years ago. And they found a hidden door at a university just for testing purposes, like a broom closet. And they spent five days, six hours a night with no book, no training, just trying to figure out how to pick the lock until after six days, five or six days, they got it down to where they could pick that lock in like under five minutes. And um, this ultimately, as I said, I'm being intentionally vague uh, with the story, but that ultimately uh, led to some great victories for animals and some animals were saved. So 
Um, when I when I get up and um, talk, sometimes um, I, I I I feel like you kind of have to have a, a target audience, and um, you can't please everybody, and you can't talk to everybody. So I try to think like, who am I speaking to when I do a talk? And uh, maybe this is kind of weird, but I always talk to. I always think I'm I'm gonna make my talk for me when I was 18 years old. Like, what did I want to hear from a podium when I was a new activist? So maybe it's kind of weird. That's why I say some kind of weird stuff, because I'm kind of weird. And I, what I wanted to hear when I was 18 is kind of weird. But um, I, I can tell you, when I was 18, all I wanted to hear when I went to a talk was like specific how-to information on how to like break into buildings and save animals. I'm not going to lie. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, so um, I, I can't talk about that. I mean, I probably could, but I'd probably get arrested. So um, I'm not going to talk about that. But there's one thing that I learned. Um, um, after the, just many years of being an activist, which is that that specific how-to information isn't so important because when you have a strong enough why, the how will always take care of itself. Do you understand what I mean? When you have a strong enough like purpose, the details about how to accomplish that will always take care of themselves. And so that is a part of this, uh, this principle of nothing ever being as complicated as you think it is. Um, when I was in, uh, I went to prison, I think some people maybe saw my talk, um, yesterday, and um, I talked about being in prison, and, and I went to prison for uh, uh, just releasing mink uh, from some fur farms. But um, when I was in prison, I was surrounded by people, you know, that we call criminals. Uh, these are people who, um, you know, um, I was in with one guy who used to drill into the roofs of banks and like break into safety deposit boxes. I was in with another guy who actually would rent semi trucks, like the giant, giant semi trucks, and back up to Walmart distribution centers and actually just have his him and his crew like walk in like they own the place in the middle of the day and just load the semi-trailer up with like expensive electronic equipment uh, which they would then sell in the black market um, like just like super like kind of like gutsy and like creative stuff and one of the things I learned from being around all these people who did all these these crimes for money is that it was actually quite appalling at how when I was thinking, comparing that to the activist movement how people are willing to go to take greater risks and do more for a little bit of money than most of us ever will for animals. And um, that was something that was very, it put things in perspective for me. Um, so what do you get from that? Like, what can we take from that? Like, the only thing I can take from that is that, you know, they desire money more than we desire animal liberation. And that's not to say that activism, that, you know, the best activism is always like the sexy, like breaking the building, rescue their animals. Like, that's not always necessarily the case. Um, but it's the fact that they took greater risks for a little bit of money than you and I, most of us, ever will for animals. And, um, and I thought that was something that was uh, um, just like a really like, like sobering lesson to learn being around people like that in prison. Um, when, uh, when I was very young, um, this is just falls into the lesson of like never being as complicated as you think it is. When I was 18, or I was maybe 18 or 19, there was a, there was a chicken slaughterhouse in Seattle. And um, I used to look in the window of this place at night I would go there at night obsessively and look in the window and I would see chickens that had escaped from that day's like killing session just running loose within the, the slaughterhouse when I looked through the window. And um, I would see go there night after night and see these chickens. And, um, and one day me and my friends got together and I just said, we have to, we have to do something. And um, we were 18, I was 18, 18, 19. We had like no skills. We never went to like burglary school or anything like that. We just, we just had a purpose that was very strong. And we went there, I think we maybe had like bolt cutters, like that was the extent of our like tools. And we just showed up at this place at 1 a.m. and we're like, let's get these chickens. So we uh, like went around the back and like scaled the wall and like kind of almost died and like one of us fell and we had to get back up and got on this wall and we're on the roof. We're like, all right, what do we do now? And we're kind of walking around. There's like this like, there's like staircase that went down into the loading dock. We're like, all right, we're, we're getting somewhere. And then there's like a door. And so we like took the bolt cutters and like cut, anyway. We ended up getting to the killing floor, the slaughterhouse, and getting these three chickens out. Now, that is, um, that is something where it, I think if you ask the average person, you put them outside the slaughterhouse and said, how would you get in? They would say, I have no idea, and they'd turn around and walk away. But there's something about putting yourself in a situation and just allowing opportunities to present themselves. And um, that's what we did that night. Um, next thing, next law, number two, um, is what I have written here is actually probably not very, very what I want to say. What I have written here is that nothing happens until you get out of your house and start trespassing. Now, in the, L, in the, in the interest of making this relevant to everybody, um, I think it's better put, maybe I should just say, nothing happens until you, you get outside your house. 
Um, this is something I call the proximity effect. Um, allow me to explain. Um, when I was uh, a very, um, again, I was very young and living in Seattle, and, um, and um, I would sit there and obsess um, endlessly over where the laboratories were in Seattle, the animal research laboratories. Now, this was before the internet, so um, you couldn't, now you can just, at least in the US, you can just look up the address for every single animal research laboratory. Now, back then, this was impossible. We had no idea how to even find out where these places were. So I sat on this, on this like quest to find these labs for a year or more without any progress. Then one day, me and my friends just said, well, we know of this place that breeds rats for labs. Let's just go there and see what happens. And um, we went there, and we just walked around. We had no plan. And we look in the window of a truck, and we see a binder on the, on the seat of this truck that says delivery list. Now, we just broke out the window and took the binder. And what we had effectively was a master list of every single laboratory in the state of Washington. Um, this was huge. Um, this information was not public. Um, and that only happened because we put ourselves in a situation with no plan and a clear mind and just allowed opportunities to present themselves. And I can tell you, this is really like the weird, weirdest thing. I'm not like a religious person, obviously, and I'm not like a superstitious person, but there's something I can't explain that I've seen play out time and time and time again, which is if you put yourself physically in a situation where you want something to happen, opportunities will present themselves. It's almost, and it's gonna sound really like, like kind of like, uh, like new agey and like weird and spiritual, but I, I swear it works. Like it's almost like the universe has this contract with you that if you put yourself there, it will meet you halfway and present an opportunity. It's very interesting. I can't even tell you how many times I've been in a situation where I just, have go to a place and I'm like, oh, well, there's a ladder that goes up to a window that's open and like just you just see things. It's very interesting. Um, and I don't really mean this to apply just to like, again, I, I really want to stress this, like just like the illegal, like sexy stuff. I mean this to apply to everything. Like if you want to do a circus protest, you are, but you're not really sure or whatever, you're much more likely to get that protest done if you go to the place where the protest is happening or where the circus is happening and you um, just put yourself there and you can envision where the elephants are going to be or where they are. You can see the elephants or you can see where you're going to stand. You can see a place to, you know, maybe you want to do a lockdown or whatever the case may be. Um, there's something like magical that happens when you just put yourself physically where you want something to happen. Um, so if you want footage of an animal, of animals in a laboratory, you're much, almost certain to sit at your house and think, how am I going to get this footage? I have to get a job there or there's really no way I can get this footage. Um, I can almost promise you, if you just go to the laboratory, you will an opportunity will present itself. I mean, I, it's just very strange how this works. I cannot stress it enough. Um, so I don't know if you've ever watched like an old ALF video. I used to watch these Animal Liberation Front videos, and uh, I was always like kind of like annoyed because I always wished the videos would start like just like two minutes before when they did. Like it's cool they're in the building, they're walking around, like they're looking tough and they're saving animals. But I want to know like how did you get in the building? And this is always what I, what I would think, and I always get like, kind of bothered watching these videos. Um, but one thing I've learned since then is that that doesn't so much matter, as I said before, that if you put yourself there, chances are you will find a way in. So do with that what you will. But um, I have almost never been somewhere that I couldn't get into. I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I've almost never been somewhere I couldn't get into. Now, I could, I'm just speaking about generally like life stuff, like if I, there's a concert I want to go to, like when I went to see Bad Religion, when I was like 19, I had no money. I always fa I found a way in. I always found a way in. Um, you know, whether so whether it's like something activist related or not, you will always find a way in. But you have to put yourself there. It's kind of like the cosmic contract. Um, I've gone places with no plan, and I have like found like blueprints to buildings inside of dumpsters. I found like like uh, like unpublished fur farm addresses, like taped to doors. I found like, I mean, just crazy stuff, like dozens of unlocked doors just walking around and like, it's just the stuff that you, you this will not happen unless you put yourself there. So there you go. Um, so that's when ideas become actions is when you bridge that gap between, you know, where you, your living room and like where you want something to happen. And there you go. Um, so number three, and this is kind of a long one. I'm just going to blaze through it. Um, the number three um, law of effective activism is demystifying legal consequences. Now, um, for the hundredth time, I don't mean this to just apply to people who, who break the law. So um, 
that's really important. But I think this comes down to just three categories, um, and I'll go over them each very briefly. The first one is fear of police, interacting with police, which is going to happen to almost any activist at some point. Um, a fear of jail is another one. Whether or not you, you, you know, you're doing activism that is overtly against the law, obviously none of us are doing that, but um, it, it's not so much that, but it's prison is a, at least in the back of our minds for most of us, we think it could happen to us. So getting over the fear of jail is huge. And then um, the likelihood of getting caught for what you do, um, which is, is another thing. Um, so when I, I'll just tell you a quick story. When I was, uh, I, I was a, like a fugitive for a number of years, I was running uh, from, from the FBI. And um, I had this like game I would play where I had, I had an ID, an identification card, a driver's license under a, a fake name. It was a real ID. So I could get stopped by police and they could run the ID and it was fine. So um, I knew one day I was gonna be arrested and I knew one day the consequences were gonna be very severe or that there's gonna be a lot at stake for me being in the situation with the police. Um, so I used to play this game where um, I would sort of bait the police into stopping me while I was a wanted fugitive. Now I did that because I wanted to numb myself to um, what it meant to, to interact with police. Do you understand what I'm saying? I wanted to, when it actually happened and, I, and there was a lot on the line, a lot more than just like a traffic ticket, I wanted to be so comfortable being in the presence of a cop and talking to a cop um, because I'd done it so many times that it was just like another day, another cop interaction. So when I got arrested, I had like a bail hearing, which is where they decide if you're gonna get let out. And um, they announced, the FBI actually had the, 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 the lawyer for the FBI had to get up in front of a judge and say, um, well, uh, uh, Mr. Young has been in police custody 32 times during the time that he was wanted, a wanted fugitive. And they'd actually, had actually been stopped by police 32 times during the eight years that I was wanted by the police, by the FBI. Um, and part of the reason I did that, I shouldn't say it was just to numb myself. I kind of actually would bait the police into stopping me because I knew one day it would come out that I, they'd, I'd been in their like custody 32 times and it'd be, it would make them look really stupid and it'd be really funny and I can get up in here and tell you about it. But, um, but also part of it was just, you know, that it was really important to sort of numb myself to that. So, um, so anyway, getting over, do you ever, have you heard the statistic that, um, that the number one fear amongst human beings is a fear of public speaking? It's like more than even death. Have you ever heard this statistic? This is true, like they poll people, they say the number one fear of people is getting up in front of an audience and speaking. Well, um, I, don't, I don't believe that um, because um, I can tell you that you know, most people, if they have to get up in front of an audience and talk, they end up doing just fine. Um, I think the number one fear of people is interacting with police because almost nobody can keep their mouth shut when they talk to the cops. History has shown us. Um, so um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's whether or not we think about it, interacting with police is very intimidating to most people. And I would, uh, I think most people who are very effective activists would overcome that fear of interacting with police because it will be necessary in your work as an activist. Uh, the next one, I'm really actually not gonna go into this one very much. I, uh, the fear of prison um, is something that I think uh, is very important to overcome. Um, and I don't mean to um, demean the realities of prison, but I think we, just, we should have a sober assessment of what prison really is and also what it is not. Um, if I had to put my prison experience in just one sense, it would be, um, it was the, the parts that were, I thought were gonna be bad were not bad, and the parts that were bad were things that I never thought of. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but um, I think, um, uh, speaking to people who have been to prison and not just relying on uh, movies or like, you know, books or whatever, not that any of that stuff is made up, but it's a very uh, distilled down uh, sort of selective account of prison life. So just, you know, find someone who's been to prison and talk to them. And also keep in mind that no one prison experience is going to apply to across the board. Everybody in just a million prisons in a million different states and countries and, and jurisdictions and so forth. So um, get a well-rounded account of what prison is and try to understand that it, it, most of the time it's not a fate worse than death. Um, last thing is a, a sober account of risks. Um, now, as an activist, um, I think we like to think that we are uh, likely, uh, there's a, a likelihood of prison is much greater than it really is. And I actually talked about this a lot yesterday, so I don't want to go too much into it, but um, um, just take a sober account of the risks. Um, everyone in the U.S., people are very, uh, um, scared about this thing called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And it's a real law that has real consequences for real people. 
and that should not be uh, should not be uh, sort of uh, downplayed in any way. Um, but there was a case where there were four people who were um, indicted under this charge or this this this, this act, um, who were they were doing legal protest activity. They weren't ALF activists. They were doing legal protest activity. And that sent a shock waves of fear through the entire uh, animal rights movement. Now, I'm sitting back, and my assessment is there are four people who got indicted, but there are you know uh, 9,996 people who protested that same year and did not get indicted. So you know, I just I'm kind of like I kind of like I'm like a do the math guy. Like I like to sit back and go, okay, so I have like a 0.04 percent chance of getting uh, indicted under the ATA. That's how I look at things, and I think that's you know I don't know who's right, but that's a more sober way of looking at things. So we tend to focus on the really negative things and assume that's going to happen to us, and don't really have a a more well-rounded uh, statistical perspective on the true risk. So I will leave it at that. Um, so the next thing I think this is law number four. Uh, number four is uh, two things. There are two sides of the same coin. This is two things that uh, uh, belief systems or beliefs that effective activists have that ineffective activists don't have. Um, it's two sides of the same coin. Uh, the first side is uh, a sense of urgency, and the other side is something we'll call speed of execution, and I'll explain what that means in a second. A sense of urgency is sort of an elevated um, level of empathy. I'll tell you a story really quick. Um, this is a story, another story that was shared with me about something that happened many, 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 many years ago. And um, this was, a, a, it was an unreported action that happened where some, um, some activists uh, learned that there were some salamanders, uh, salamanders that were held inside of a specific room at a specific uh, university building. And, um, and they learned that these, these salamanders were going to be dissected on the next day. And um, as a matter of fact, they had a very narrow window where they could actually get in the building and actually access these salamanders. They were told that the room was actually left unlocked. It's just that nobody knew where it was, so they weren't concerned about anybody going inside. So um, these activists, in plain clothes, no ski masks, no gloves, no planning, reasoned they could probably, because of there's so much activity in a university, they could probably just walk into this room, pick up the salamanders, and walk out. And that's exactly what they did. And so they rescued, I think it was like several dozen salamanders. And it was never claimed, it never got publicity, there was never like a communique sent out, it was just something that was done quietly. And, um, and, um, and that was only done because of this sense of urgency, which is like this elevated level of empathy where you actually, um, you actually uh, see the world through the eyes of the victims, of the animals. Now, um, this is very difficult to sustain um, because you'd probably be in prison in like under an hour if you truly viewed the world through the eyes of the animals because you would be doing things that would just be motivated entirely by like fear or you know, self-preservation. Um, so I, it, you can't really live this way in the literal sense, but understanding that you should always look at a situation through the eyes of the animals in every possible uh, time that, uh, situation that you can, um, that is what highly effective activists do. Uh, there's a line, you know, like, uh, uh, live your life as though you were the persecuted, okay? I think that, that's what I'm talking about. The next, the other side of that coin is like the unemotional side, which is speed of execution. Effective activists know that, this, that uh, the speed with which they actually carry out their actions determines how effective they will be. Now, um, I would say that easily, I'm going to pull a number out of the air, but 95% of the, action, the things that I planned to do that I postponed never happened. And most of the time I postponed them because of some obstacle that was in my head or because I was trying to achieve some perfection in the plan instead of just getting it done. So um, with that came at the cost of, I'm just estimating, like I said, 95% of these plans just ended up not happening. So um, in, in uh, like the, the software world or like the startup you know, business world, they have this term um, minimum viable product, I think it is, which basically means if you, you're writing some software they know that their success in the marketplace depends on how fast they can get it out to the, to, the, to the public. So they will rush software out to the market that isn't perfect and they know it's flawed, but they get it out to the market because you have an advantage when you get it out first. And if you wait for perfection, that day often never comes. So um, there's a really incredible, and by the way, I don't want this to be confused with haste or, um, or, or introducing um, unnecessary risks because you're so focused on like getting something done. You know, the fundamentals need to be handled, but after that, you should just focus on doing something instead of doing something perfectly. Um, there's an amazing book. I really encourage everyone to read it. It's called The War of Art. Not The Art of War. The War of Art. Different book. 
And, um, and the author talks about something called res the resistance. And um, the resistance is that little voice in your head that, that, that talks to you every time you have a big plan with big goals and big uh, uh, consequences um, for, for animals or whatever it may be. Um, and the resistance is that, 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 like, that thing that tells you, that voice or whatever it is that tells you, like, that tries to talk you out of it. And he, the author says, that's how you know you're onto something good, when there's a voice in your head telling you not to do it. That's, that's like, you know, like, that's like, I don't know, it sounds kind of like weird, but like, that's like the universe, like testing you. Um, and um, I've seen this in myself, like every time I have a great idea, immediately I'm, I go towards like, why can't this work? And um, I think most of us have some variation of that. Um, and by the way, um, on this idea of like the speed of execution, how many people here have noticed that the more you talk about something, the further away you get from actually doing something about it? Have you seen this, this phenomenon? It's like, it's like um, there, and there's actually a term for this. I found this like, psych, it's like psychological journal paper recently. It's called narcotizing dysfunction. We're talking about something on a psychological level gets equated with doing something about it. And so that's like why people in, you know, I don't know, like hardcore bands tend to not be activists. Like they're, so, they're on stage talking about how tough they are and they don't actually do anything. And I think we all see this, like the big people who talk the loudest are usually the ones that are doing the least. And, um, and, 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 and this is like a very dangerous thing. I started to notice this in myself. Like I have this book I've been working on and I would always like talk about, I'm working on this book, I'm working on this book. And consequently the book, I never made much progress in the book. Well, I started, well, with the exception of right now, I stopped talking about this book because I knew that the more I talked about it, the further away I was going to get from accomplishing it. So um, be very um, cautious of this. We used to have this term when I was like doing, I don't know, like ALF stuff many, many, many years ago. Um, there, were this, there were certain people that we called them uh, uh, recon artists. Um, it's sort of a play on words, but like reconnaissance and then like con artists. But these people that would like go out and look at stuff all the time, like, oh, I went and checked out the slaughterhouse or this fur farm. And they were just like so focused on like looking at stuff and like staking it out and doing recon and doing nothing. And they would spend years like staking out their targets. And it was like the more they, time they spent like researching stuff and, and hiding in the bushes and like watching the building and taking notes on like security and all that stuff. The, the further they got from actually doing anything with that information. And so uh, that's the speed of execution. Um, let's see here. How are we doing? Probably bumping up against. Okay, so, so we're right at the 30-minute mark. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it's easier to get forgiveness than permission and just go over just a little bit. I hope everyone's cool with that. Um, okay, so next thing. I think it's the second to last one. or no, third to last one. I'll go through it real quick. Um, learn to identify your limiting beliefs. Um, effective activists understand that there, they are, there are beliefs in your head that hold you back that may not actually be factually correct or objectively true. Here's a, a great story to exemplify this. I, uh, and I, I apologize if I'm talking too fast. I, everyone from Europe tells me I talk too fast. Um, I, uh, there's a, I, my house got raided some years ago, um, and they were um, claiming to be investigating this uh, raid that happened at a laboratory uh, in Iowa, the state of Iowa. Uh, I think it was like 2004. So I think there was like 400 animals that were taken out of this lab. And for whatever reason, you know, we were like five states away. And for some reason, they thought we might have something to do with this lab raid. And it was like a vegan house in Salt Lake City. And, um, and after, the, la after the, 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 co the FBI left, me and my roommate were driving around, just like kind of processing the situation. And my, my roommate had been an activist for a long time. And he was like, we were looking at the warrant, and we're like, oh, University of Iowa. He's like, He's like, it's crazy that, um, that in 2004, um, this was 2010 when the, our house got searched, so it was like six years after the fact. He was like, it's crazy that these people were able to get inside this lab and get these animals out, um, like 400 animals, and like do like half a million dollars in damage at this lab. And he said, it's crazy they could do that in the year 2004. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, that's because everybody knows you can't break into labs anymore. He said, it's just impossible. He said, after the 80s, when there were tons of labs getting broken into, all the labs locked themselves down, and that it was impossible at that point to break into a lab. And I said, OK, well, let's explore this. Like, um, how, how do you know? What is your evidence, your evidence for this belief? And he's like, oh, come on, man. Everybody knows you can't break into labs anymore. And I was like, all right, well, let, maybe, maybe not. But I, I wouldn't know personally, but let's just explore this. Like, what evidence do you have to support this? And he just kept saying, oh, man, come on. Everybody knows that. And so I was like, well, OK, so have you ever actually even been to a laboratory? And he's like, no, but you know, I mean, people. 
And so we did this like circle like 10 times and, and, and I got him to admit that he had no evidence to support this belief. Um, so here's, and that's a fantastic example of what you call a limiting belief. And we all have these beliefs that something can't be done. And we might think we have evidence to support the belief, but in reality, uh, the evidence is not always objectively true. That's a, and that's a great example. Like, you know, these buildings or these, you know, I'll just use this example, but like a lab wouldn't even have to lock their door if they had us all believing that they, there's no way you could get inside. You see how that works? Like beliefs are a lot more uh, limiting to us than like any kind of like surveillance equipment or like police involvement or repression or anything else. It's our beliefs. Um, so um, what's interesting about beliefs is that they can be changed. And uh, you bear with me because this is going to be a little bit kind of like a weird thing I'm going to get into. It's kind of like new agey or whatever, but um, um, you can find evidence to support any belief. Um, for example, um, um, consider that story I told you. Um, my friend had his, quote, evidence to support the belief that you couldn't get inside a lab after the 80s, and the people that broke into the lab had a different set of beliefs. Now, you can find evidence to support any belief. So, um, for example, um, if you wanted to, I'll just use a kind of a weird example, but like, let's say you know, like there's a girl across the room and like you want to talk to her because you think she might be interesting and like worth getting to know or something maybe here at this conference. Now, if you think of yourself as an unattractive person, like physically you have a bad personality, whatever the case may be, you think that you're unattractive, you're not likely to go over and talk to that person. Somebody who thinks, considers themselves interesting and attractive is probably going to be comfortable going over and talking to that person. Now, for each of those people, I could find 10 or 20 or 100 people that would say that they're unattractive, and I could also find 100 other people that say they were attractive. It's just a matter of where you focus your attention. You can find evidence to support any belief. So um, there's very little that's actually objectively true when you kind of think of beliefs like that. Um, it's like my friend saying a lab raid is impossible. You know, the people that carried out that lab raid in Iowa had a different set of beliefs. So who do you think got more done that, that one night in 2004? The person that believed labs couldn't be broken into or the people who thought, found, sought out evidence that labs could be broken into? Obviously, the people that had the, the second set of beliefs. Um, so um, people who are effective activists choose to um, believe things that are empowering to them, not things that are disempowering. Um, next one, and I'm, gonna, I'm probably just going to go, so yeah, we'll have like, 10 minutes for questions, so I'll just give a few more minutes. Um, uh, this one's real quick. Um, the effective activist, the, the uh, highly achieving activist, does not give a damn what you think about them. Um, let me tell you what I mean. I think we all know people who, and even this is true of a lot of activists, before they do anything or say anything, they'll look over their left shoulder at the person next to them, look over at the right shoulder, and then they will decide what they want to say or do. I don't mean that literally, of course. I just mean they survey their social landscape and decide what's going to be fashionable for them to do at any given moment. Um, and on some level, I think we're all affected by this, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that are a lot worse than others. Um, I, uh, I heard somebody, uh, a really great quote that somebody said, um, I don't know the recipe for success, but the recipe for failure is to try to please everyone. Um, People who are highly effective activists, um, they don't get into like debates on the internet. They don't even care about debates. They're too focused on you know, taking action. Um, people who are really effective activists, they don't survey the crowd and decide to do um, what's fashionable. They don't even know what's fashionable. They're too focused on their outcome, right? Um, and the achiever has actually, um, and this is kind of an elevated level of this, but you, they've actually delegitimized opinions. Opinions themselves have no merit, no, no validation. Actions are the, are the only thing that counts. Um, and I think we can all agree with that opinion because the highly achieving activist knows that your actions are your only true, your only true measure as an activist are your actions. It's not how well favored you are by other activists or, or the public at large. It's what you do and how effective you are for animals. When I was in prison, um, one of the, probably the only cool thing about being in, or about the culture of prison is that, um, all that matters in prison is what you do. What you say has no merit. You're either somebody's best friend or you're stabbing them in the throat. Like there's no in between. Um, it is considered to be extremely um, uh, looked down upon and actually sort of culturally forbidden to like talk shit or criticize somebody. 
either their best friend or you're punching them in the face. That's it. And what I appreciate that about that is that it 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 takes a while, strips away all the nonsense and just gets down to like the action. You're either doing something or you're shutting up. That's it. There's no in between. Um, and uh, and I think that is um, one of the great things I took. One of the only, <laughs> definitely the only thing cool that I took uh, from prison culture. Because a focus on opinions will always come at the expense of your mission. Um, and the highly achieving activist answers, obviously, to the animals and nobody else. So the last one I will get into, um, and then I guess we'll have 10 minutes for questions. And this is the biggest one of all. This is one I really could give a whole talk about this subject. And it's, it, it's hard to put a category on, but it is um, uh, understanding fear. Um, it's demystifying fear, and it's actually using fear as fuel. Um, I noticed early on in my activism something very strange. Um, when um, I think we all think of like doing things that might be a little bit risky and we get a little nervous inside, obviously that's natural. Well, um, one thing I found is that when I'd be, say, when I was you know, raiding fur farms, for example, we would, I would be extremely nervous in the car driving to the farm. Um, I'd be extremely nervous before we got in the car, in the days before that. I'd be extremely nervous when we parked. And as soon as we got out of the car and it was go time and there was no turning back, the fear vanished. Um, now, why does that happen? Um, it happens because when you're in the moment where um, you're taking action, um, you're focused on your mission, fear is absent. Fear only happens in anticipation of something. It never happens in the moment. And, um, and I think if you really thought about that, you would see that play out in your own life. Um, Almost none of the things you have feared in your life, almost none, like 99.999% of things that you've feared in your life never, ever happened. Um, how many of us like get in our car and we're driving to work and we think, oh, God damn, did I lock the door? And we just go over it in our heads over and over. Did I lock the door? Did I not? Did I turn the stove off? Um, you know, like you have a pain in your leg and all day you're like, man, is this cancer? I don't know. Like, what is it? Um, and, and uh, you know, you, let's say somebody, you had to give a speech for school or something. You're like, oh, I'm going to get up there and everyone's going to hate me and laugh at me. Never happened. People, you know, people didn't even notice you were nervous. Um, so almost nothing that we fear ever happens. And so if we look at it in that way, fear is actually like the worst measure of, of how scary or um, possibly negative something is. Fear will deceive you. Um, and the fear mechanism, if you look at it like from an evolutionary biological perspective, it's, it's, it's biologically um, natural to experience fear, of course. You know, you're getting chased by a tiger and, the, you know, whatever. Um, fear is meant to be, but here's the thing about fear. It's meant to be very brief, and it's meant to be a servant of intuition. Um, but today, we live in such a, such, a fake, you know, such a fake world, like we're so detached from our natural uh, origins that it's very rare for us to experience actual true fear. So do you ever notice how people actually today in, you know, this, you know, like the first world or like civilized society, whatever, we actually invent things to be afraid of. Have you noticed this? Um, we'll actually like go and like watch scary movies because we like long to fear on some level because it is biologically natural. Or we do like things like extreme sports where like you bungee jump and all this like weird stuff. Or um, I heard a story about uh, about uh, somebody who like who lived in like Los Angeles, and there like some wildfires that were like, like literally like three hours away, and they got a phone call from their mom that was like, uh, "Oh my God, you know, are you okay? I just want to make sure you're okay." And the guy was like, "Mom, you know, th those fires are like, you know, those are three hours away, right?" And she's like, "Well, yeah, I know, but you know, I just want to make sure." It's like we invent things to be afraid of. Um, and it's, it's crazy when you notice how often people do this. I kind of talked about the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act a minute ago and how it's, it's very like pervasive in the, the American animal rights movement for people to fear the AETA um, simply because like they pass out vegan literature or they like wave a sign outside a building or something. Like this is very, very common. We are inventing things to be afraid of because on some level we like crave that. Um, I heard a story, I had a friend who was in jail, kind of like, an, like a remote location. And there was like one like vegan kid in that town that could go visit this friend who was in jail for activist stuff. And um, so people contacted this vegan guy and were like, hey, you know, this guy needs some support. Can you go to the jail and like visit him and like drop some money off and all this stuff? And this kid said, no, no, I can't do that. He's like, I don't want to be put on the list. The list. 
Um, you hear people in America talk about the list all the time. I would love to see this list. I don't think, I don't think there's a list. Um, but um, he was so paranoid or so like fearful of like being put on a list that he wouldn't go three blocks to visit this activist in jail. And that's an example of like inventing fear. Um, so the point about fear is that in the modern age, it is working at the wrong times. And what biologically speaking was intended to be um, a, a great like preserver has actually become a prison for us in the modern age. Um, they did a study, this is absolutely fascinating, to get back to my first point, um, of robbery victims, people who had been held up by gunpoint by someone they didn't know and robbed of their money. And they asked them, one of the things that came out of the study was that in the moment that they had a gun in their face, not one person said they experienced fear. They, had a, they, had a, they were very uh, focused, they were very present, they were very, um, you know, they're thinking like, how can I get out of this situation? But fear was actually absent. And um, I've been in some situations that were um, things that I thought would be very intimidating in the moment. And I, afterwards, I, I thought it was very strange that my heart rate wasn't, hadn't even increased. My heart rate increased every time I thought about that situation before and after. But in the moment, I was so focused on, you know, like the survival instinct kicks in that there's no fear. So um, I think that is a fascinating example of what I'm talking about. So the point of all this is that the true remedy for uh, fear is, is action. Um, if you have something that you're fearful of, anywhere on the spectrum of activism, um, the remedy for that fear is to actually do it. Because when you're in the moment, fear is absent. Um, and I think the most, the biggest point I could make about fear, and I, if, I, if I could sum up this whole section, it would be in this like one or two sentences, which is that fear is the feedback you get when you're about to maximize your potential as an activist. And fear is the feedback you get when you're about to maximize your potential as a human being. So don't fear fear. Um, understand that fear is sending you a signal that you're about to do something awesome. So to end this talk, I will just wrap up and say, in conclusion, just to kind of go over these things, uh, again, like the seven uh, laws of, of militants or highly effective activism, whatever you want to call it. Um, nothing is ever as hard as you think it is. Um, demystify legal consequences, get outside where things really happen. Animals don't die in cyberspace. I think we all know that. Um, destroy your limiting beliefs. Uh, answer to the animals, not the opinions of other human beings. Um, adopt a sense of urgency and carry out your actions as quickly as you can um, um, without uh, unnecessary delay. And uh, demystify fear or use your fear as fuel. Um, and you should do these things because um, the only true measure of an activist is your actions. In fact, the only true measure of, an act, uh, of your life are your actions, uh, nothing else. So thank you.